title of my message is The Struggle is Real. Isn't it? It is. Now, you might know this phrase because of all the memes and everything that happens on social media. For instance, as an example, if people, I don't know why, they like telling their whole lives online and, and Instagram and stuff, somebody will post something like, I burned my pizza, and this is the 20th time that I've made it, and it comes out like this every time. Then I would be, as the mean person, I would send a picture like this and say, the struggle is real. See, in other words, I don't have a problem making the pizza. I don't know what your problem is, but you got the problem making the pizza. <laughs> Reality is that, just to, as a quick background, this phrase actually started back in the 80s, and it was actually started by rappers, believe it or not. Because what happened was the rappers decided, and one fellow by the name of Grandmaster Flash decided to start talking about serious things instead of party things and crazy things. And he decided to talk about what it's like to live in the ghetto. And so what he did was he started coming out with this, other people followed, and when other people followed, it became this huge thing, and it changed the whole face of rap music. Um, I was going to uh, read uh, an example of this. is just a short example of what he said, but I decided maybe I should just rap it instead. <laughs> now, I have the skills. I think I do. But just as a quick excerpt to show you that what changed the face of rap music, it went something like this. Broken glass everywhere. Um, and I went blank. Broken glass everywhere. I can't take the smell, I can't take the noise. Got no money to move out, I guess I got no choice. Rats in the front room, roaches in the back. Junkies in the alleys with the baseball bats. I tried to get away, but I couldn't get far because a man with a tow truck repossessed my car. The bill collectors, they ring my phone and they scare my wife when I'm not home. I got a bomb education, double digit inflation. Get the train to the job because of the strike at the station. The child grows up with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind, but God is smiling on you, yet he's frowning too, because only God knows what you'll go through. You'll grow in the ghetto of a second rate, and your eyes will sing that song of deep hate. The places you live and where you stay look like one great big alleyway. You'll admire all the number of boat takers, the pigs and poop. Those pimps and pushes and the big money makers drive a big car, spend their 20s and 10s, and you want to grow up to be just like them. And that changed the whole face of rap music. But, and then everybody started saying, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a confession to make. I actually memorized that when I was 15 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and that was years ago. I was more of an Aerosmith, you know, uh, uh, Van Halen type of guy. But anyway, um, but an interesting point, just to move a little side, quick side note. It shows you how important music is and how it really does have a spiritual value to it. I memorized that when I was 15 years old, and to this day, uh, my la mia testa or cabeza, my my head still has it stuck in there. And um, so, I had a calling on my life when I was young, and um, I knew that I wanted to put some things away from my life. And one of the things I put away from my life was secular music. So at the age of 17, I made a promise to the Lord that I would not listen to secular music anymore. You see, the, the effect it has on me is still with me today. And you know, music is very powerful. You can feel the emotions when you first heard a song in music. And so, um, yeah, to this very day, I only listen to Christian music. If you check my phone, I have over 7,000 Christian songs. Because back then, there was no Christian radio. It was, it was hard to get, you know, Christian music. But anyway. But this morning, we're going to talk about um, a serious matter, something very serious, and we're going to be talking about the struggle is real. And if there's anybody in the Bible to use as the first example, as the struggle is real, is Job. Listen to this. First, the Sabians steal a thousand oxen, 500 donkeys, and slaughter all his servants. Fire, they think it's lightning, uh, burns up 7,000 sheep. The Chaldeans attack and steal 3,000 camels and slaughter more servants. In a matter of minutes, Job loses all his wealth to being literally penniless. It is estimated that the loss that, he, uh, that happened to him was $56 million in today's money. That's what he lost in, in an instant. But that's not all. 
A mighty wind, possibly, a tornado comes, hits his brother's house, and kills all ten of Job's children. He is afflicted with <laughs> bad breath. His face is red with weeping, and his eyes get dark rings around him. He is afflicted with painful boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. His skin turns black and starts peeling off. He has a fever. His wife tells him to curse God and die. His friends blame him for what's happening to him, and he cannot sleep, and he becomes emaciated. And the Bible says he is as skin and bones. If anybody knows... The struggle is real. That's a struggle. But this morning, open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I'm reading um, from the New American Standard Version. And it says, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeing someone to devour but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Now, notice Peter here never tells us how we can escape our struggle. As a matter of fact, nowhere in the Bible does God show us or tell us this is how you escape your struggle. What he does tell us here, Peter does tell us here, is how we must face our struggle, which is important. Verse 8 says, be sober, spirit, be on the alert. The word sober here in the Greek means to be free from the influence of intoxicants. It is associated with the words like awake or guard. So what he's actually saying here in this verse is to be free from intoxicants. What struggle that is in your life is causing you to be so distracted that you're taking your focus off of God? That's You're intoxicated with whatever obsesses your mind. You, if you struggle with, uh, you know, not, you, you're struggling with your job, if you're struggling with some personal issues, if you're struggling with some family issues, if you're struggling with your health, what is it that is distracting your mind so much that it's intoxicated you and you can't even think about going to God and asking for help? That's one. First Thessalonians uh, chapter 5 says, So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. So we see here that you have to be on guard. Remember that. We are in a spiritual battle, and whether you know it or not, there is an invisible world out there that you can't see that is in existence as we speak, and it doesn't stop because you become a Christian. It doesn't stop because you're not a Christian. That world keeps going. That, that demonic government that exists and the spiritual world is moving. That godly government, that God is there with the angels, that he rules over in existence, that moves along. And we live our lives forgetting about that world. Second Timothy uh, chapter 4. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. So Paul is telling Timothy here, remember, you have to be kingdom-minded. Okay? Don't let your struggles, don't let your mind be unclear. Don't be afraid that you're suffering for the Lord and you can't go talk to somebody about the Lord. It is very important to carry out the calling that God has given us. And believe it or not, each and every one person in this place has a calling. God will use you sometime or another in your life to touch somebody else's life with the gospel. Whether it's just your testimony, just by the way you live, or something you say, it, it has its effect. So sometimes our suffering and our struggles can help us lose perspective if we're not careful. Notice verse 8 says, Your adversary, the devil. Now, in every good story, there's a hero. There is always a villain. Sometimes the villain is weaker, other times the hero and the villain are equal, and sometimes the villain is more powerful than the hero. The fact of the matter is, the hero is always tested by the villain. And, you know, just to dumb it down, 
if you've seen all these you know, Marvel movies in the past, or if you're familiar with comics and all those heroes and stuff, just an example, how would the movie come out if all the superhero did was take cats out of the tree? That wouldn't be a very entertaining movie, would it? It'd, it'd be quite boring, if, actually, if, if you ask me. Uh, the, the, the villain in our story is not to make it easy for us. The villain in our story wants to be that perfect adversary, and I'm going to be honest with you, the villain in our story is stronger than us when we're by ourselves, whether you like it or not. Um, just a quick uh, note here, on 7-23-23, this is last month, the Breitbart Gallup poll on the percentage of Americans who believe in God, who believe in angels, heaven, hell, and the devil are now down to new lows. And by the way, I also read that Protestants, uh, prompt on Protestants, not all Christians, Protestants going to church were 44%. It's now down to 40% after COVID. Three years, the church, Protestant church, lost 4% of their church community. That's horrible, if you ask me. But 74% of Americans believe in God. 69% of angels believe I'm sorry, yes, yeah, 69% of Americans believe in angels. 67% of uh, Americans believe in heaven. 59% believe in hell. And 58% believe in the devil. Now, the devil loves, 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 loves the stuff like this because this makes his life easier. If most of the people, as the culture grows and gets older and older, forget about him, then he has the victory and he doesn't have to do anything. See, nobody becomes a threat because nobody believes in him. But he can keep doing what he wants to do, bringing more and more people to hell. And nobody even notices why, because hell doesn't exist. I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in the devil. And that's his, his perfect, perfect plan. But as Jedi Master Yoda once said, Ah, oh, a disturbance in your faith, I sense. Believe in hell you do not, but not believing changes not your going. <laughs> He didn't actually say that, but it sounds kind of better when he says it, right? Not believing in hell does not mean you're not going. Amen. Actually, a pastor actually said that once. The devil is not doing this for a good moral purpose to... Uh, let me back up. The word adversary in the Greek means an opponent in a lawsuit. Some would regard the word as used in a legal sense since the devil accuses men before God. So the devil is not having you stand in a court of law because he has some moral issue with you. He wants to take you to hell. So in other words, there you are, you're sitting here, on, on, you're here the defendant, okay? You're sitting here and you have the Lord Jesus sitting here and you have the Holy Spirit sitting here. You have God the Father as the judge there and then you have Satan and his demons accusing you. And he's saying, this guy over here, <laughs> he's a sinner. This guy's a sinner, and he belongs in hell. What, what good can he do? Goodness doesn't get him to hell, and God the Father sits there and he listens. And the devil spews out all his accusations, like the Bible says, against you, speaking all this stuff. Well, this is what she did. This is what he did. When he had the opportunity to do this, he turned his back selfish. He's selfish, and he's going on and on and on. And so what happens? And it's the Lord Jesus' turn to talk. And he stands up and he says, Father, Father says, Son, he says, He's covered under my blood as of January 1st, 1978. He accepted me as his Savior. He's covered under the blood. The Holy Spirit says, I vouch for that. I live inside of him. And he's been doing a pretty good job. And uh, reads his word, studies the word, talks to people about you. Father says, Satan, get out of here. He's coming with me. And he enters the pearly gates. Well, that's not how it really happens, but you know what I'm saying. The devil is accusing you all the time. This is why he is that accuser. Now, verse 8 says, he prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The word prowl means to move about and wander stealthily in or as if in search of a prey. So that, if you love watching documentaries like I do, I love documentaries, this lion here is hunting. And right now he is looking at an Apollo. 
the Impala's clueless. You know how Impalas are? They're just like, <laughs> they're like, you know, how they hop around like that. And he's just sitting there waiting patiently. I'm gonna wait for this guy to get a little closer before I burst, because they, they have short bursts of power. They're not like the cheetah that can run long distance, which is one of the coolest animals, by the way. 78 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour they run. And so he sits there and he waits, and then all of a sudden, he springs out. Now the Impala, because they see in black and white, I believe, he can't see him at all. He is completely camouflaged. You can see him because you see in color. But he can't see him. And when he pops out, the Impala's like, like, where did he come from? And then he's pounced on. And that's what Satan loves to do to the saints. He loves to, to, to attack us stealthily and to take us by uh, uh, surprise and, and to, to knock us down and to totally try to destroy our lives. Now, um, Job chapter 1, verse 7 says, The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth. And this always reminds me of those, if you remember in the old days when you went to the circuses and you saw the lions and the tigers, and they were always like, the kids were standing like right here and the bars were here, and the lion would always just be doing this. Yeah. Oh, man. If those bars weren't there, you look soft on the outside and crunchy on the inside. Man, you look delicious. And that's what Satan's doing. He's like wandering the earth to and fro, walking back and forth. Who can I devour? You look juicy. Oh, you're an easy prey. Oh, I like you. Yeah, okay, we're going to work on you. Yeah, and that's what he does. The devil wants to eat you, and he's not going to knock on the door. He's not going to come up to you and say, hey, uh, like Wile E. Coyote. Do you remember Wile E. Coyote? He would always have a business card. And I always remember, he only spoke in like maybe five cartoons. But there was one of them where he walks up with a door that's folded. And he walks up and he puts the door down and he sets it up. And the door comes up. Bugs Bunny's holes on the other side. And he goes, do do do. Bugs Bunny comes up in an elevator. He comes up, what's up, Beck? And he says, I am Wile E. Coyote. Genius. <laughs> now, it's futile for you to try to run because I'm here to eat you. I'm much smarter than you. I'm much faster. So you might as well just let me get this over with. And of course, chaos ensues and Bugs Bunny does what he wants. The devil's not going to do that. The devil's not going to introduce himself and he's not going to put himself in plain sight. He's going to deceive you in such a way that you are so relaxed or that you forget why you're supposed to be doing or what you're supposed to be doing in your life that you lose track. And again, you become intoxicated. You forget what you were doing. Don't forget, he is starving and he will eat anyone he can. That's why the Bible says there in verse 8, he wants to devour you. Now, remember, we are out in the tall grass. Picture yourself in the tall grass and your mind starts to wander. He gets to distract you and think about it, the lion is in that tall grass slowly creeping towards you. Now if you're paying attention, you will know what's the grass is moving, something's moving. What, what's that noise? Because you're paying attention and you, you start to know what's going on, right? You, you know, you become, um, you're not distracted. Did, did you ever uh, talk to somebody specifically in a room with hundreds of people. Everybody's talking. Everybody is saying everything, and you're focused just on the person in front of you. You understand perfectly what the person is saying to you. You're catching everything they're saying, yet you can still hear other, what other people are saying. And you see, that's what Satan wants. He wants the crowd to start to distract you so you stop listening to the Lord Jesus standing right in front of you. So you stop listening to him and you say, well, what is, that? what is that person saying? What is that person saying? And he's talking to you and you're not paying attention. That's what he would love to do in your life, to distract you. Verse 9 says, but resist him firm in your faith. So let's break this down into two parts. Resist him. You say, uh, but how do I resist someone who's so much more stronger than I? Right? He has the advantage in so many ways. I mean, for goodness sakes, he's cloaked. If you're a Star Trek fan, you know what being cloaked is. It means invisible. You know, the Romulan ships were cloaked. The Klingon ships were cloaked. 
and they were invisible and they could always sneak up on the federation and attack them you see he's close how do i fight something i can't see you know you get hit in the face and you're like well where did that come from right and then you're also thinking well he's so much stronger than me well you see like every good hero in every good story you have to level the playing field and there's only one way you can level that playing field god has leveled that playing field for you number one he's washed you in the blood okay let's get that out of the way number two he has filled you with the holy spirit number three he has given you a weapon called the word of god and when you have that word of god in your heart in your mind in your soul man it is powerful he's also given you the gifts of the spirit and also, he's given you the best self, cell phone service on planet Earth. Never cuts out it, never breaks it. It's called prayer. Instant communication. You know God's phone number is John, uh, Jeremiah 3, 3, 3, right? Look it up. Chap Jeremiah chapter 3, colon 3, 3. Call on me. And I will answer you. Okay, so. Um, now, the word firm here in the Greek, it means solid. It means to take one's stand, to place oneself firm. Uh, Proverbs 24, 6 says, For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. That's another gift God has given you that I almost forgot to mention. He's given you this body right here as your army. Amen. You know, uh, as, as your, uh, in, in, your protection in essence. Peter is saying here to be intentional in your faith, to be solid in your faith, to take a stand in your faith. Now, if you know anything about history, and that's another <coughs> thing that I like, if you've ever read Herodotus, he was a Greek historian, he told this famous story of the Battle of Thermopylae. And the Battle of Thermopylae is about the 300 Spartans. And the 300 Spartans, what they do is they tell everybody else to go home, and they put themselves up in a small pass with a mountain here and an ocean here. And what they do is they decide to take on the Persian army who wants to take over Greece. There's 300 men against anywhere between 100,000 or some say even a million people. And the Spartans every day for a short period of time slaughter the Persians in heaps. 5,000 die, 1,000 die, 3,000. These are 300 men. You know why they survive? Because they believe in the training that they were given. When the Spartans stood together, they stood together all in a close formation like that, and their shields were all close formation. They had nine foot spears, and they never broke from that formation. They knew that as a body, they were strong, and they were invincible. But if one Spartan decided to chicken out and run and put a hole in that shield, then the, the Persians can come right in. You see, and as the body of Christ, we have to remember we are like the Spartans. We are shielded together by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit, by God. And if we keep in a tight formation, Satan cannot break this body, and he will not have victory against us. So remember that. Verse 9 says, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Peter also tells us that you should be prepared and expected the spirit experience of suffering. Just like others have struggled, you will too. You're not alone though. The NLT, I like the way the NLT says that. It says, remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Isn't that cool? Verse 10 of that verse there says, and after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So now Peter encourages us to let us know that there are perks in suffering, believe it or not. Well, how do you call that a perk? Suffering is not a perk. Well, listen, pain is necessary and it is a necessary part of our lives. Pain is a part of the curse, the sin curse, and we live in a sinful world. Um, I remember, and I've told you this before, I was probably, I don't know, eight or nine years old, and I said to my dad, Dad, you know what? If I was God, I wouldn't have created pain. And my father, being the doctor, of course, was like, sit down, son. <laughs> That's one of the most stupidest things I've ever heard. No, he didn't say that. He was good. He's, <laughs> he was like, do you know why God created pain? He says, no. He said, if I took my hand and I put it on the stove 
and the stove was on, and I didn't have pain, I would have no idea my hand is burning. Sure, it would start smoking, but I wouldn't feel anything. It would start to burn the flesh off, it would burn down to the muscle, and it would literally destroy all the nerves, and I would be burned down to my bone if I left my hand there. God put pain in our lives to say, whoa, I'm gonna get hurt. I gotta step back for a minute and think about what, that, what just happened to me. He's trying to protect us when we have suffering in our lives. Now you may not see it that way, but he does it for a very important purpose, and sometimes we don't understand why God does certain things, but he does it for a reason, and it's done only for the benefit and to better you and to help you and to protect you. You have to remember that. Now, one perk is you are drawn closer to God in suffering. Um, I don't know about you, but I run to God for protection when I need to be protected. And we're protected under his wings. And Psalm 61 says, from the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Mm -hmm. So like when you're struggling and you're in trouble, drop what you're doing and just run to God because he's there with his wings of love, his arms of love, and he's standing right there because he wants to protect you. Dr. Champ Charles Stanley, if you remember him, he passed away recently, he once said, God allows adversity in our life to get our attention. We just go along in a life and doing our thing and ignoring him. And sometimes we ignore him after he tries to say to us in prayer or in many other ways or through someone else what he wants us to do or what he wants us to think about. It's so important. Matthew 14, 22 says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up onto the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. So how did the Lord God see the struggle that was coming to the disciples' life? Well, in the first place, he knew about it, it was, it was gonna happen, it was intentional. Being in close fellowship with God the Father, the Lord Jesus knew what was gonna happen to the disciples when he sent them on the boat. And what does the Lord Jesus do? Does he rush out to, to, to stop the struggle? No, he goes by himself to pray. He let some time to sink in. He wants these disciples to start to think about their spiritual lives here. He wants them to start to think about what just happened. I mean, think about it. They have just seen 5,000 people fed. They had time to sink this in in their faith, right? They should have had this sink in, in, into their faith. But how did the disciples see the struggle? They were terrified, crying out in fear. They think a ghost is walking towards them. That's how they perceived it. Interesting, right? It's normal to panic when we are not in tune with God. I know that. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 says, That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the, stu at the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So how did God see this struggle? Well, the Lord knew that nothing would happen to himself or the disciples. So what did the Lord Jesus do? I'm taking a nap. <laughs> Give me a cushion, I'm taking a nap. I'm gonna go in the stern of the boat. And that's what the Lord Jesus did. How did the disciples see the struggle? Lord, don't you care that we're drowning? 
Now, where are they drowning? They were drowning. The water was coming into the boat. Anybody who's been in a boat, you know, it takes a lot to really put a lot of water in the boat. But the Lord Jesus knew that nothing was happening. So where is their faith? What were they focused on? Jesus, this time, was literally in the boat. They had actual contact. You know what they should have? I would have did. I would have just went like, <laughs> sit down right next to him. Just hold his hand. <laughs> just, I'm touching Jesus. He's there. He's right there in the boat. But what do they do? They all stand around and they start looking at everything that's happening. The wind, the waves, the water in the boat. Doesn't he care? And he says, what's the matter with you guys? Don't you have any faith? Job chapter 11, verse 13 says, Yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then free of fault, you will lift up your face, you will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as water has gone by. Life will be brighter than noonday, and darkness will become like morning. Now, this is, how does God see the struggle for Job? Well, Job is the finest man in all the earth. He says that in the Bible. He says he is blameless. He is a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. If Job would seek my joy, the Lord is probably thinking here in this situation, he could have peace. Now, his friend Zophar, who says this here in the text, how does he see Job's struggle? He says, all the suffering, everything that you is happening in your life is rooted in sin. You should have just repented, and then you can be happy. Now, verse 17 there says, life will be brighter than the noonday, and darkness will become like morning. We have also, as believers, this so far mentality that we need to be happy in the struggle. We have this idea that when we're not happy, then God has to be punishing us not. We think with this Zophar mentality, that's what I need. I became a Christian because I want to be happy. But happiness should not be a part of a Christian's life. See, happiness is not something a believer should seek because happiness is, number one, external. Happiness is temporary. And happiness, believe it or not, is selfish. And it's an earthly emotion. It's not a kingdom emotion. Show that video for me. But isn't it true? It's true yes. Do we not use material things in our lives to make us happy? I'm so sad I'm going to go shopping. And you spend three hundred to four thousand dollars on clothes, and you're happy. You are. You're happy. Oh, I'm going to buy myself a new car. I deserve it. Oh, you know what? I'm going on vacation. I'm going on vacation. I had enough of this job. And what happens? You go on vacation, and you come back, and the job is the same, and your happiness is just disappears right away. That's because the same sad you that went on that vacation comes back as the same sad you. And it's working the same sad job. Sorry to call your job sad, but I didn't mean that. But, <laughs> but see, happiness is not something as a believer that we should have. If you want to make your burden made lighter in your, str in your struggle, then a believer should look for joy. And there is a difference. See, joy, on the other hand, is given by God, it's eternal, it is selfless, and it's spiritual. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. See, the joy of the Lord is entirely different than happiness. The fact of the matter is this. When you die, you take that joy with you into eternity. Amen. When you die, happiness does not come with you. It's temporary, very fleeting. John chapter 17, verse 13. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. You see? Joy can be a gift to get us through that struggle that we are going through. And finally, John chapter 15, verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. See, joy is given from God. 
And as a believer, we can receive that. If you're not saved, you don't get joy because you don't know the Lord. That's a gift from God. So when God gives you the joy, that joy, as the scripture says there, is completed because you're a believer. That scripture, again, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. See, something clicks as a believer. Joy can be used to help us in the struggle because it is from God. Dr. Charles Swindoll once said, and I, I believe he said this, um, he said, we will never suffer here on earth more than those who are separated from God for all of eternity in hell. Amen. So you see, when you're going through a struggle, no matter what your struggle is in your life, you think of that point. There are people now in hell separated from God forever that they can't, they, they can't change that. They're the rich young ruler, that, that the rich man from Luke chapter 16 who dies. And he says to Abraham, hey, you know, can you tell my family? No, you had your chance on earth. You can't do that again. So we all have a choice. We all have a decision that we must make. What life choice will you make in the struggle that you are in in your life right now? Are you going to trust the Lord as your best interest in mind? You're going to trust that the Lord uh, right away uh, is there with you? Or are you going to think, oh, he's not there? You're going to be like the disciples in the boat when Jesus is literally in the boat. And, you know, you, you're actually looking at him and you're not going to trust him. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. I have no idea. I don't, you know, no, we don't talk about personal things like that sometimes. And sometimes we have things that we keep in our heart that we tell nobody. But God knows what you're going through. God knows what's in your heart. And he knows that struggle. He knows that doubt. He knows that pain. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows your disappointments. And all you got to do is just give it to him. It sounds easy, but it's not really. But you have to take that step in faith to take it and lay it at his feet and say, okay, I'm truly surrendering this. I don't want it anymore. I don't want it in my life anymore. Come into my life. And Imperials used to have a song, come into my life, change my life forever, my heart forever. Let's do that. Let's trust God this morning that he is here. He'll always be here in our lives to make a difference in our lives. Heavenly Father, how we bow at your throne and how we desire, Lord, to know you more and more in our lives. Father, anything that is in our lives that is intoxicating our lives, that is poisoning our lives, help us, Lord God, in this struggle that we're in, this mighty storm, to just keep our eyes focused on you, knowing, yes, I know what you're going through, you're thinking. I know what you're doing, what's happening in your life. And help us to just Lay it at your feet, Lord, to know that you truly do love us, that you truly have the best for us, Lord God. If we would just stop looking to the left and to the right at the storm and the waves and the water and the sinking boat, and we could just say to you, I don't care what happens. As long as you're here with me, Lord Jesus, I'm going with you. 